Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar this afternoon, where we will be looking at uh, craft and design enterprises, the complete story, and focusing on businesses that are mainly three years or less in operation and all of the facets involved. We are moving our uh, interaction to a, a more clinic approach. So what will happen is um, there will be three presentations and then we'd like to hear all of your questions uh, to do with the financial, the design, the selling aspects of your businesses. And we'll have um, an open forum through Q&A in the chat box at the end. So if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A. I'm delighted we have a very large number of you with us today. And um, I have three speakers. Uh, first of all, I have uh, Bernie McCoy, who ran her own knitwear textile um, firm and uh, is now a senior lecturer in NCAD and brings a lot of experience to the table. She'll be coordinating, chairing today. I then have, uh, to her right, I have Donald Horgan, who is uh, posing as Bernie McCoy, um, because he's probably coming on a Bernie McCoy invite. Um, and I'm going to ask him to go into his rename and uh, change his name, but we, we know he's the only boy in the room anyway. So that, that's Donald. Donald is going to address the financial aspects of your businesses and any questions that you may have. And I'm honoured, thirdly, to have Adriana Doyle, of um, Doyle Design Studios. They are jewelers and they have been in business through trials, tribulations, ups and downs now for 22 years. So everyone, welcome to this afternoon's uh, webinar. And with that, I'd like to invite Bernie to kick off. Thank you. Thank you, Emer, and thanks for having us um, involved in this webinar. Um, it's great to be able to sort of feel like you're giving something back to the craft community and design community. Um, so really what I want to do is I'll, I'll briefly outline what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm just going to present my screen and hopefully this will all go to plan. Okay, so we have Okay, I assume you can all see that. So what we're going to talk about today is um, really we've broke it down into three different areas. Uh, product, so things around the product end of, of design, around your ideas, about life cycles of product, uh, how that impacts on your business at the moment, positioning, where you're selling and how you're selling and who you're selling it to and who you're commu communicating to. And we're going to look a little bit as well at finance. Um, and just to see, you know, is there something there that you should be aware of as you're going through developing your, your new business. Uh, managing it all as well, you know, how you can pull, pull it all together. So those are the topics that we're going to cover for this webinar. And the first thing, the main thing I think really is important is that you, you take time now to review what you've been doing already. And unfortunately, we are in this position with COVID that many of you within that early stage startup of business, it's unfortunate that you've hit COVID in a sense that it's a difficult time anyway. And it's a time where you might stop after two or three years in business and really review what's working, what's not working, you know, what should I change, what should I adapt, and recognizing maybe the difficulties that you've had. And I know from previous experience of working with young entrepreneurs and young startups, that that three-year gap is the critical bit. It's the bit, it's, it's the, the time where you really discover, is this going to work for me? Is it not? You might be working like anything and not making any money. And you're wondering why I've got all these orders in or selling loads online and nothing's really going the way you want it to go. So it's that three year cutoff point where people say, yeah, this is working. I'm going to stick with it. This isn't working. But you've got a double issue. You've also got COVID on top of that. And I think it's really important at this stage that you stop, take a few minutes, take some time look back at what bits of your business is really working for you and really review that and ask those, those questions. Um, and around the product end of things, you know, it's like things like, how do I create anyway? What drives me to create the pieces I create? And what is working within the business itself? And why is that particular thing working? And what can I do to even change it or make it even better than it is already? Or maybe you pivot or you change and you readapt something. 
So in terms of product, um, you know, do, your idea and your concept and your aesthetic behind your, your business is really, really important. So evaluating that and looking at what is it I'm, what is it that I'm about and what makes me that little bit different to everybody else? So what, what items do you create and what message is it that you want to give to your consumer? And what do you want to say about you and your business? And your product sits in the middle of all of that. Um, so when you're designing your product ranges and your products, you have to have all of that in mind that you're driving it in a certain, certain look or a certain um, aesthetic to define you. And then why would anybody want it anyway in the first place? So what makes it so special? You know, somebody could be making pots, ceramics. You know, why were they going to buy your pieces over somebody else's? So what makes you that little bit more interesting than somebody else? And you will turn around and say, well, I'm creative, I'm a designer, I'm trained as that. And that's what makes it different. But really think about, is it that or is it how the customer sees what you're doing and how it relates to them? And why is it that it, it sort of sparks an emotional response with them? So you need to dig a little bit deeper at this stage. You'll have tested a number of products or a number of uh, design ideas and product ideas at this stage. And normally at the beginning of your business, you'll be trying everything. You'd want to sort of test this, test that, test this type of design, that type of design. And you, you'll have figured out the ones that are working and the ones that, that you think are actually the stronger items within the product range that you're producing. But just remember that at that early stage, you are testing things. And yes, you want to be testing lots of things, but you don't want a collection or a range of products that are all over the place. And there's a bit of this in it and a bit of that in it and a bit of something else in it. You want it to be really cohesive and really hold that messaging that you're trying to send to your consumer. So although those early stages, you want to have variety and testing and reiterating, narrow it down as quick, as soon as you can. And does it, does it have something else a bit meatier in there? You know, is it, is it on trend? Is it engaging with what's going on out there already? Is it making a statement about something? Can I latch it on to something that's going to make it even more appealing to the consumer than what it is already? Um, and what is the real, real impart, important element of your ethos around your product? You know, so what is that core element that you're really wanting to get across in your messaging? And is it, am I actually selling it then in the correct place? So am I designing for the right audience? Am I, am I targeting the right people? And those are really key areas that I think you should review, look at, and look really deeply at. Ask questions like, what are people saying about the product that you produce? So what do they say to their friends? What do they say to other people? What do they think about what your, your product? You know, do they think it's worth the, worth the purchase? What do they think in terms of its quality? Do they think it's fabulous? Are they going to go out and tell everybody else because they think it's fabulous? And then doing, so what are they doing about it? So if they, if they sort of say they like it and they think, they may think about having one at some point, do they actually physically go out and buy it? So you need to kind of realize at what stage, what are people doing and, what, and how are they reacting to the product that you, you've designed and made? And then I wanted to just talk a little bit about, you know, where does the current, the current product that I produce now, where does it fit? So you might have said, well, I'm uh, commissioning led and you're at that really, really high end. You might have said, well, you know, limited editions are my thing, my or batch production, I'm outsourced. So figure out what is the core element of your business. What's the important bit? And everything else will actually come back to that. So if you decide you want to be high-end commissioning, but you're finding that tough because it's fairly niche and you decide, well, you know, maybe I need a limited edition to go along with this. That limited edition, you have to figure out how does that impact on the core the core element of my business that's the focus point that's the most important. And if it doesn't enhance it, and if it doesn't improve it, and if it doesn't make it stronger, you need to question as to whether that's the right thing you should be doing. Um, so really look at that. If it's a thing where actually, no, limited editions are what I'm all about, batch production is what I'm all about, but I need the commissioning element of it because that gives me a little bit of kudos in a certain area, 
and it just means it's another it's not the main core part of my business but it's an element that drives the business forward and it improves its uh, perception out there in the marketplace so just be clear about what bit of the business is your core bit and why are you doing all those other little bits to feed into that and to support it if you're doing ranges and collections of things keep them cohesive keep a theme going through it you may well have experimented with lots of different ideas don't be bitty be very focused bring the collection together edit it bring it in have it strong don't ever show work in a portfolio that you do not want to make there's no point make sure the portfolio is is strong in terms of what you're saying what you're doing what you want to do in the future don't go putting stuff in for the sake of filling gaps and be consistent in everything that you do be consistent in your design process and your creativity and your quality brand and, and identity and then figure out who else is out there that's doing it really well in in the marketplace and context of my work and figure out where do i sit alongside them a good idea and i would recommend you do it is do case study on somebody they don't necessarily have to be in your product area or your your field but just find somebody you really admire who you think's done a really good job how have they got there and do a little bit of a case study on them and can you learn from that and can you look at another business model or enhancing your own business model to make sure that you are looking at opportunities and possibilities and maximize your product fit your value proposition which is the, that core thing that your business is about that is really important and unless you have that you can't produce a product range because you don't know what you're offering so you need to define what is it that your value that you're bringing to the marketplace. Find out what your competitor's value proposition is, what customers actually are looking for at the moment that you can address. You'll find things that are very similar between your competitors and you, but actually that's not what you're after because anybody can do that. You're looking for what makes you different to the two of them, two areas. So what makes you different to everybody else? So you're looking for differences. And then your value, you, you need to define what that is. So find out what your value proposition is. Some people might call it your unique selling point, but you need to figure out why my product, why my range is really different and gives a different offering to somebody else. So make sure you spend time on that. And write the statement. So if you take something away from this, write your value proposition statement. What that does, it, 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 it hinges everything together. So if you're confused about whether I should do a new range of um, say product batch range of something, if you go back to your value proposition statement and it doesn't uh, resonate with that, then no, you shouldn't be doing it theoretically. Okay, so once you've got your value, state, value proposition statement clear, you know that that's what's driving the business forward. That's a really important element. And it helps with how you're seen and how you want to be seen. And perception is really, really important, particularly when you're going to go at this point, a lot of you to online selling and e-commerce. Product launch, we as a group of creative people like to be in that early market bit. And we don't necessarily like to jump into mainstream markets. We're happier in that place. So you're going to be selling to people that are called innovators. And those are people that love taking risks. They really like something a bit different, a little bit new, and they're going to take a risk on you. And they're the people you're targeting initially with your new product. List, they, the early adopters listen to those risk takers and they will hop on board if they like what they see. And if they think Johnny up the road has one, why shouldn't I have one? And it'll look really cool in my house or whatever. So those are this, that's the area in the early market that designers and creatives have a tendency to stick in. It's rare that they make the big leap into the other mainstream markets, but we obviously would encourage you to do that if there's an opportunity there and if you're ready for it. Um, but to make that leap is quite, it, it's, it's a, a large, it's a challenge and it's where most people have a, a, a major difficulty. Um, but if you are ready to do that, it's, it's a good place to be in. In terms of your product development and where to go from now, you're looking at your first product range, having your early adopters, they're there. Don't lose them. Hang on to them. Be a bit more innovative in your product development going forward. Figure out what they liked and what they'd like in the next range and how you can impress them. 
because you don't want to go back to the start again each time you come out with a product range. So figure out some strategy around each time your new product range comes out, your new product item, if it's commissioning led, how is that impacting on what you've already previously done and how can it take the business forward and upwards? And then I'm going to actually pass over to Adrienne, if that's okay, Adrienne, if this, we're going to talk a little bit more about communication and about the business itself. And I shall stop sharing. That Bernie, I'll just share my screen. Let me see if we can. Oh, of course, it's disappeared. Um, my husband and I owned a wine design and we're handmade jewellery bespoke business based in Dublin City Centre. We've been around for 20 odd years. I feel quite old when I say that, but it's um, it's it's been really, we've had our good times, we've had our bad times and we've had ups and downs and all that kind of things like anybody has had in business. My own background is in psychology. I studied psychology for six years and then I practiced for two and then decided this is not for me. So as my mother would say, it's a, an awful waste of an education, but I don't think so. I think it's served me um, really well and everything I do, every interaction I have with people, every negotiation I do is based on psychology. So I'm no expert at anything but I love to share my experiences and hopefully you won't fall into the same pitfalls that I've had. So if you will allow, I'll just, things that I think are relevant now at this particular time, at this particular junction of your business. So my main point here was, was focus and I think when you're three years into business you can be a little bit higgledy piggledy you're not really sure exactly which direction you're going to go in and when you've got three years of experience or more under your belt you seem to have developed lots of things moving in lots of, of different directions so i think it's important as bernie said to start focusing on what are the things that are working for you what direction do you want to go in is it retail is it wholesale is it both I don't know if any of you have your own bricks and mortar stores or if you're all selling online or if it's a wholesale business, but think about what direction you would like to go in. I know that when we were about three years in business, we were, we were doing okay, but we weren't really lighting up the world or anything. So we decided to focus on wedding and engagement rings and bespoke wedding and engagement rings. And we did press releases into every bridal magazine. We did every major wedding show, trade show in that area, the big ones. And we enjoyed terrific success with that. <clears throat> so that was a, a focal point for us. And then later, we, when the crash happened, um, you know, 2008, 2009, it was a similar kind of a situation where we had to pivot, you know, and like we've talked about now, this is kind of the buzzword right now is pivoting and finding something else that's working for you. So, <clears throat> excuse me, at that stage, we were only doing retail and we started wholesaling then and we took off to America and started doing trade shows in America. We've got about 30 stockists in the States at the moment. So it's, it's a good time now where we are now with maybe with a little bit of time on your hand to have a look at your product range and like bernie said maybe focus on what is working for you build collections around products that are working for you and eliminate any dead weight i know that we, as we were doing our, when we went to the states we had a massive celtic range and it kept growing and growing and growing and growing and we were almost offering too much and we had to pair it down because you kind of would confuse so it's a good way to just kind of get rid of any dead weight and, and not have any product hanging around that's 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 not working for you then where specifically do you see your product being sold where do you want it what shops what retail outlets what online outlets where are you thinking and then how are you going to get it in there i i know it's it's i don't know how long it's going to be before we're doing trade shows again but i know there are some new innovative online kind of trade show elements that might be worth looking at if you want to get your product out to a wholesale range. Also, if you have an idea of a company or a business that you would like to get your product into, you're probably going to have to do some, some cold calling. And I, I honestly, it's not something I'm terribly comfortable in, but I just have a few quick notes on, on cold calling. Um, and this comes back to my psychology basis. It's the first thing I would say to you is never assume that the person that answers the phone is not the person that you need to be speaking to because everybody within, no matter how big or small the organization is, you just never really know who you're talking to. And that person 
if even if they're not the decision maker, may well be the person at the end of the day who would be selling your product in this particular store. So if you didn't give them a nice impression, if the first impression that you had with them, if they if you negated their importance, they're not less likely to have a vested interest in selling your product for you. So just bear that in mind when you're talking to people. I would always have notes, a little script ready, like little little things that you need to you know answer quickly because it can be quite intimidating when you're talking to somebody that you you don't you don't know personally or you haven't met before. The best sales approaches I've ever had from people because I have we have our own retail store and we wholesale so I know from experience you can be mad busy you can have people ringing you all morning trying to sell you something and if the best approach is always the person who just realizes that you're really busy and gives you an option to opt out so I would just have a, a very respectful you know this may or may not be for you this might be something I just thought it might be something you'd like to look at it's up to you if you want to have a look at it again you know I'd be delighted to show you it's a it's just kind of a different a more a soft sell and then on top of that it's also important to note that there are different approaches expected for different geographical locations so americans expect sort of a harder sell irish like a softer sell but they're just important things to keep in mind when you're when you're when you're cold calling people and um, the other thing this is all business is relationship based and people buy from people they trust and they like so I think now, particularly with the whole COVID situation, it's really vital that you're building relationships with your current customers, whoever they are, whether they retail or wholesale. During the whole lockdown thing, I, I rang everybody, anybody we wholesale to, and had a chat with them, asked them how they were doing. And I made it clear from the beginning that we're not looking for a sale or a, you know, a, or, or money, um, that we're just looking to see how you're doing. And if you can build relationships with people, it's built on that trust and that communication. If you ask your stockers for feedback and be prepared for maybe negative things, maybe things they didn't like, maybe things they do like, just the more communication you have with people and the more honest you can be, the, the, the better it will be in the long run. And try to see a relationship as a collaboration, not a one-off transaction. I said here, first orders are great, but repeats are, are what really matters. So, if you can collaborate with with your stockers and ask them what it is that you know they think you might they that you could do for them that would help you might have video that they could share on their social media you might have images that they would find really helpful for use in store you might like to do competitions you might like to do in-house demonstrations whatever is logistically feasible or relevant to what you do and then i would say be honest don't bite off more than you can chew with anything if you're going to commit to doing something be sure that you're able to do it and then follow through with it and execute it well and be committed to it and um, lastly notes on the dark art of social media and website it is a bit of a dark art it but it's absolutely vital right now and i i've built our website four times since 2013 and it's still not perfect and I think some wise person once said to me your website is never finished your website is always in flux or it's in it's dynamic and you can be dynamic in your social media more than in your in your website your website yes you definitely need to keep an eye on it with your seo and you're changing and adding product to it but your social media is really what drives the traffic back into it i think and i've noticed over the time, the last few months that I've been speaking to people who are experts in this area or who certainly have a really good knowledge about it, that websites are really changing a lot at the moment. They're no longer um, a brochure. They're no longer focused on the product. They're more focused on selling a lifestyle, selling a, an image, being a brand, telling your story. And the product is almost an afterthought. And somebody very recently told me to have a look at far-flung websites websites of product that you do but somewhere miles away and search for it and have a look at the ones that rank at the top and have a look at what they're doing like what bernie said earlier you know have a look at what others are doing and try to mirror it not copy it but mirror it and understand it and where it's going and, and, and how it's working for them i think that emotion is a very powerful selling tool and particularly it's particularly true with jewelry but it's also true with other products if you can connect some emotive reasoning and feeling with the product that you're selling it's a really good selling tool i said they're talking into the void to 
oftentimes when you're doing stuff on social media, you may not be getting much feedback and you're thinking, is anybody really listening to me? You know, is anybody, you know, is anybody interested in this? But what I found certainly over the last couple of months, and I've monitored this really carefully, is that if there are people, you may put up product and it may disappear off your story for, on Instagram or whatever, but I've had people come back to me two or three weeks later with screenshots going, I love that, I want that, or where's that gone? I can't find that on your website. So even though you may think you're talking into a void, I don't think you really are. People, it resonates with people they, and they remember it afterwards. And then the spend a little. I'm not a huge person for Google, AdWords, it's you can spend an awful lot of money on that. It depends on what your product is, but I would certainly look at spending money on Instagram and Facebook on advertising. It's a very, very targeted approach to it. And the other thing I would say to you, Adol, is, 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 is trust your product and trust yourself and trust your gut, and um, you won't go too far wrong. And if anybody has any questions afterwards, I'd be delighted. That's that's my my lot for the afternoon. That's brilliant, Adriana. Thanks a million for that. It's great. Um, and uh, Donal, are you? All right to go? I think so, yeah. Uh, how do I share your screen? Is the little yellow oh, share my screen? Share my screen, share screen. Okay. I forget. Oh, share. How's that doing? We're in, yeah. Can, can you, you just you need to put up the presentation, Donal? Okay. Uh, is that there? That is. And just, I just put it into um, full screen mode, yeah. No, that's a challenge for me. Uh, da, 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 da. Side on the screen usually. Screen now view. Present, perfect. Present. How's that? You're absolutely there. Brilliant. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, thanks, Bernie, and thanks, Adriana. Um, Donald Horgan is my name. We're with HFS Accountants. We're in McGrath and County Leash. And we are, uh, I suppose, a small regular accountancy practice. And we meet, I suppose, a lot of different clients from coming from a lot of different backgrounds who experience, I suppose, a lot of the problems that businesses such as your own uh, might experience uh, as you grow from, from startup to, to a more mature business. Um, and in thinking about this afternoon, I, I, I tried to think of what I might be able to say that might add a little bit of value without putting you all to sleep, which is, is, is usually what an accountant might do. So I, I, I've tried to be kind of somewhat consistent with what Bernie and Adriana had been saying, but coming from, I suppose, an outsider looking in uh, at, at, at the type of business that we have coming into us. And the first little tip, I suppose, that I would try to give you is, is that I'm sure you will often have heard the necessity for a business to produce a business plan. And, um, when I hear that word business plan, I oftentimes I cringe. I think, oh my God, the thoughts of having to do one. But they are a very, very valuable tool uh, for us, not only in, in, in day one or, or, or before we go into business, but as we progress through the years, uh, because it forces us, not, not unlike if in an employment situation and you need to do a CV, it's, it's sometimes very difficult to do, but it forces you to look in the mirror and look at yourself and look at your own business and look at where you've come from and where you want to go to and try and put out a plan. And it is sometimes daunting, which is why I say that question I'm sure you've all heard is, how do you eat an elephant? And, and the answer is you do it one bite at a time. Um, so just to get into the mindset of my business is a serious proposition, where I'm coming from, where am I going? And then sit down and do your business plan. And the business plan will typically have the, the six or seven different areas I've highlighted here. Um, but it is of immense value, I believe, for every business to sit down and constantly review and every couple of months update what is their business plan. And it is a tedious exercise sometimes, but it, it is something that will be invaluable to you, especially as you progress through the years. Um, now, we won't say too much more on a business plan, and I'd like to move on to a kind of a negative uh, question, which is, where do businesses fail? And in our experience, most businesses will fail because they don't have enough customers. Now, uh, I know the focus of the previous two presentations were more on, on product and customer and so on, but on customers, not to be negative in any way, 
but there's a stat that I've come across that I've reproduced here as to every business will lose customers from time to time. It's an inevitability. But if we analyze where we lose those businesses, as you can see in this slide, and, 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 and these figures uh, may not be particular to your business, but if you just take the generality of them is 1% of your customers are gonna die. It's inevitable, it's gonna happen. 3% are gonna move to friends. 5% might physically move away geographically. 9% of your customers might leave because of price. 14 maybe unresolved complaints. But, but the gist of this slide is that the vast, vast majority of customers that you lose will come down to you showing a lack of interest or enthusiasm or concern for them and their needs. So I would, I would try and have you just think about that and, and try and make sure you remain committed to your customers. Because at the end of the day, if you have no customers, you will not have a business. Um, and, and that's the simple gist of that slide of what I'm going to try and get across. Um, in your day-to-day -day life, be it from nine to five or be in your social life or be in a Sunday or in your family life, you've got to get out and you've got to meet your customers and potential customers. And everybody out there is a potential customer. And every time you go out the door, every time you say something, every time you walk down the road to the grocery shop, everything you do can reflect on your business because you don't know who your potential customers are. And it might be that there's a multimillionaire living across the road that you never knew. So you've got to put the best face forward and you've got to present yourself as if everybody you meet is a potential customer and you act accordingly. Um, and, 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 and selling is difficult. There, there is nobody out there. I think we would all recognize selling is very, very difficult. And in Ireland in particular, we, we don't have that kind of, I suppose, what I would call, um, what, what the Americans, it seems to come to them second nature. They, they seem much easier to sell themselves. They're, they're much easier at, at, at presenting themselves to the world. And again, I've heard the joke, I mean, it's 30 years old about the guy that worked in the, in the forecourt of a garage. But, you know, over here, we've got another job in a garage. But out there, they're a fuel injection engineer. And they're, they're brilliant people to jazz themselves up and sell themselves. But it's selling is hard work, regardless of your training. And, and, and if you have training in selling, um, you'll, you'll know how hard it is. And the other aspect, again, I suppose, which is very important and oftentimes may be ignored because we're, 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 we're very focused on trying to get a customer and we're very focused on delivering a product or delivering the service and we're not so focused maybe on getting the money. And, and the best, I suppose, the best definition I ever got from a boss of mine one time years ago was that the sale isn't over until you've been paid. And you've got to work it and work it and work it. And collecting money is hard work, but if you don't do it, you'll end up selling an awful lot of product and I'm afraid you're going to be in the poorhouse at the end of it. So don't neglect the collecting money because it's, 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 it's vital. And the last little tip, I suppose, in relation to customers, I suppose, is there, there, there is or there can be a, um, there, 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 there can be a, a, a push on us to look at the shiny new customer and ignore the ones that we have. Um, we're always looking at the next guy, the next product, the next this, the next that, the next the other. But we already have an existing product line. We already have an existing uh, range of customers and we cannot afford to neglect them uh, because it's, it's, it's much cheaper to hold on to an existing client than it is to bring in a new client. So if you can maximize by holding on to your customers that you've got and then adding, uh, a, 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 you know, you will grow and, and the growth might be a little bit slower, but it will be steady. And, and the last little tip I've got in relation to sales, and again, we're accountants. So, I mean, we're not marketing people. We're, 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 this is just coming from the experience that we would have seen over the years. Um, that sometimes selling can be what we call a numbers game in that if you work back and if you want to make a sale, then you've got to get a meeting with a client. And if you've got to get a meeting with a client, then maybe you need to make four or five phone calls but before you get four or five phone calls, you might need to make 50, you need to knock on 50 doors. But if you don't knock on the 50 doors, you don't get the four meetings. If you don't get the four meetings, you won't get the sale. So if you, as I say, do the bats and you try and multiply it out and figure out how many calls, how many cold calls that Adriana mentioned earlier, how many times you've got to knock on a, on a cold door in order to produce a sale. 
And if you can get that in your head, it will tell you how difficult it is because you've got to knock on an awful lot of doors and you've got to be ready for an awful lot of no's and an awful lot of rejection. But unfortunately, that's, that's, that's business and that's, that's, um, it's, it's not always easy. And in fact, if it was easy, we'd all be doing it. So um, get your customers, keep your customers, keep looking after them. Customers can be an awful pain in the, from time to time but they're what paid the bills at the end of the day. So um, I would, I would, I suppose, try and encourage you all to, to uh, work as hard as you can on, on building and, and growing your customer base and looking after the customers you have. And, and, and to remember, it's never easy and it's always gonna be hard work. Uh, the utopia of, of these mythical customers that will, come out and buy the product you want to make and, and pay the money you want to get paid, they largely don't, uh, they largely don't exist in our experience. Um, so that's really all we've got, very, very short. Um, it's hard work, get loads of customers and, and then you'll have a thriving business. Wait. A little bit too short. Not at all, no, not at all, don't know. Thanks for that, that's great. Um, and I suppose it just supports everything else that myself and Adrienne have been, ta been talking about. I'm just wondering, just Donald, on another thing, I know we spoke ourselves earlier about whether there was any tips generally on things to watch out for, for startups or early phase businesses in terms of the revenue side of things or compliance or things that are good tips that, they, that might be relevant to them. Would you have any, any insights on that? Yeah. You know, I, I, I would. I suppose it's it's to use all of the uh, use all of the expertise and the help that is out there, and um, I mean the banks can provide great help. They have a lot of industry experience. They know their finance. Go in and talk to them, and um, go in and talk to the county enterprise boards, the design and craft centre. All of these places they have fantastic expertise in their different areas, and um, they are inexpensive. They are there to help. And, and don't be afraid to ask for that help um, because it's, it's, it's there. It's in everyone's self-interest that, that your individual business su succeeds uh, because the more you succeed, the more taxes you'll pay and it falls back into the whole how the economy works and how we get money to run around. Um, so don't be afraid to ask for help and, and don't be afraid to ask a bank for a loan. I mean, oftentimes they'll say no, but what harm? Doesn't, doesn't do any harm to anybody if they say no. Um, if you've got a problem with the revenue, lift the phone and talk to revenue. Um, the revenue people are, are very easy to deal with, um, but you've got to talk to them. If you don't talk to them, if you've got a problem with a supplier, talk to them. You know, that's, that's in our view, uh, the most important part. Uh, I think, I, I don't know, was it Bernie or Adriana said it earlier, but it, it, it's built on personal relationships. So go and talk to as many people as you can. You would be surprised in our line of work how, how many times we get people coming in and they want to register a new business in area X, Y, or Z, but they haven't told anybody. They haven't told their friends. They haven't told their family. They haven't told, and these are the people that are going to be their first customers, but they're afraid to tell people. Don't be afraid. You know, every opportunity you get to market yourself or market your product or services, go and do it. Because all the big guys, all the, all the big guys do it. I mean, uh, let's take the biggest of the big, Michael O'Leary of Ryanair. He'll sell his mother to get five minutes on RTE to tell you that he's going to sell you, uh, 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 you know, 50 pence to use the toilet or something. And he knows he'll get thousands of free, thousands of advertising out of it. So he, he, he's not, you know, he's, he's, <laughs> he's not shy about selling Ryanair because he has great faith in the service that he's delivering. And you should have great faith in your service and product. And don't be afraid to shout it from the hilltops. And don't be afraid to ask for help or ask people and let people know that you're there. Um, in, 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 I mean, in the day-to-day, -day, oftentimes, again, on the accounting and taxation side, we'd have a lot of clients that are maybe a little bit intimidated because they don't understand maybe, maybe some of the tax or some of the regulation. And, and I would say to you, in my own case, um, I probably maybe understood it too well and, and for that reason, didn't go out on my own until I was 35 or something, because I feared, Jesus, what if this happens? Or what if that happened? Or what if the other happened? Whereas if I had jumped in, I should have jumped in when I was 25, I would think. 
So regulation is, is terribly important, but far, far, far more important than regulation is having customers. Because if you have no customers, you have no business. So you might know regulation inside out, but you'll have no business. Whereas if you get customers and you have a customer and a service and a product, the, you know, the other stuff will always come. And you can always, you can always learn that as you go. I mean, it would be perfect if you knew it all before you started, but, but nothing in life is perfect. So I would say concentrate on your business, sell yourself, sell your product, get your customers, and, and the rest of it is, is, is kind of secondary. You know, it, it is important, of course it's important, but um, it's, 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 it, it's far easier to sort a problem with the taxman out if you've got customers and a product and a service. If you've no product or no service, you're in trouble then. <laughs> Donald, Donald, may I ask a question? Um, over working with the uh, craft and design people through Building Craft Enterprise and the other 25 years that I've been working in this, they find a huge problem in um, credit control. Yeah. So I'd love your opinion on that from the kind of, um, as you say, the more regulatory end mm -hmm. and like chasing, chasing payment. Yeah. And yeah. then Adriana, maybe you take it up because you'd be at the, at the cold face when people long finger payments. So Donald, do you have any insights onto how to get that 3,000 euro invoice that's not being paid? How, how does one get it absolutely. paid? Absolutely. Well, I, I suppose the first thing is to be absolutely upfront with anybody at the very start that getting paid is, is as important as any other part of the, the delivery of your service. Uh, and, and, and I suppose in a perfect world, you're going to collect deposits and in a perfect world, you're going to get stage payments or, you know, and in a perfect world, you won't give out credit at all. So if you can get by with doing those things, then do. So use the rules that are there and, and try and get payment with order and so on. Um, but to the extent that you can't, and we have to recognize there is a world out there, but you've got to impress upon the, 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 the customer of yours that they have to pay it. And you should feel, they should feel under an obligation to pay you. Oftentimes we feel a bit intimidated and we don't want to lift the phone to the customer and we don't want to lift them and say, oh, Mr. Such and such, will you pay me my bill? And we're kind of apologetic for asking to be paid. Whereas, again, I'll ask you, is Michael O'Leary, does he apologize for asking for his few bob? No, he doesn't. And he has hundreds of millions coming in every month. He, he, he makes no apology for it. He asks and he asks forcibly. So, again, I've often, we've come across clients that would use maybe a husband and wife or a, or a partner one versus partner two. And, and if you have that situation where one party can be kind of the salesy type, marketing type person and, and kind of sell, 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 while the other is the Rottweiler and there to collect money. But, you know, that, that, can be, that can be used on occasion. But I know the best credit controller I ever met was a girl in, in Liverpool, actually, and she was a very softly spoken, uh, and, and I, I inherited her in, in a manner of speaking in that we bought out a company and she came working for us. And when I met her first, I thought, God, this girl won't last a day because she was so quiet and, and mannerly. And but she was the best kind of controller I ever met because she was so tenacious. And she rang and she, she spoke beautifully and she spoke very softly, but she didn't get off the phone until she had a commitment, you know, and, and, and if the commitment wasn't delivered on, she rang again and again and again. And she was fantastic. But oftentimes we don't, it is hard work and oftentimes it's easier you know, not to make the phone call or not to send the email. Whereas you just got to do it. It's, it's, it's stay after people, stay after them, stay after them, stay after them. And, and remember, you don't have to be obnoxious or you don't have to be, you know, any of these negative words. It's, it's all you're doing is asking for what was already been agreed. So ask. You can be polite, but ask forcibly. Yeah, I, I would agree with you there, Don. And what I, we find as well, we always do first orders on pro forma and then that's fine but then thereafter there is a bit of it like people are like well now can we not get a bit of credit and they, they, there is that push on it i find in the us and in europe it's much easier just to continue with pro forma they kind of expect it now they actually don't expect credit anymore they'll give you their credit card details immediately with an order which is wonderful that is not the case in Ireland. Um, they will stretch it for as long as they possibly can. So again, I think it's back to building relationships. It's having a name. It's having the name of the person who answers the phone, having their name, having the next gatekeeper's name, the next gatekeeper, and getting to the person that you need to be talking to in that way. Again, like the lady you said that was working for you, it's not a, it's not a push or an aggressive 
you know, when you're when you're collecting money you really need to make them feel like they really should be doing this you know this is you know, we need to we need to be talking about this now you know and then i would be very cautious about it when you when they're looking for another order and they owe you money that's when you're in your your bargaining position i would be you know if, especially if you've been waiting a while for payment to come through that's when you can say well actually you know if we're going to you know proceed with this next order i'm going to need to get paid for you know what's already going on yeah. i would also suggest particularly now at the moment it's you know people are really struggling and you know stockists are struggling to pay and you know people are slow to pay so maybe there might be room if you can carry it for negotiating maybe if you were to pay me for like 25 percent of this order that you're asking me for or half of it now and half of it in a few so if you could talk to people and see what what works well for them um but I think again, it's it's communication, like you said, like that lady's just chatting, and people feel obliged. Then they really feel, you oh, know, I'm going to have to pay this person. Yeah, I would agree wholeheartedly. Yeah, and I think it's very important that you value your worth. Um, it's an industry where we don't, where traditionally in the creative sector is not valued as much. Um, you can bet your bottom dollar that if it's somebody who's um, maybe some expert in in IT somewhere they're going to put their bill in and expect to get paid you know the major cons consultant in some medical center somewhere he's going to get paid she's going to get paid so why you know don't think you're going out with a begging bowl it's it's your due you've done the work you're valuable so know your own value and um, make sure that you ensure that that's you know that you that you are gain that respect from whoever you're doing business with and don't forget that that it, it, you're not going out hoping to get paid you're going out to be paid yeah and, and if i could add to that bernie um not only do i find and, and again that's common across all industries I, I i don't think that would be unique to to this particular um um business but people also when you're self-employed and running your own business, you fulfill two functions. Function number one is you work for the business in that you're, you're, you're involved in the design or the creation or the selling, or you know, you're something, doing something directly with the business. But you also have to manage the business, which is the second function you perform. And, and that is a role that has to be paid for. And again, you, you, you've, got to, you've got to, I suppose, work that into your costs, but you've got to value yourself when you're working on your business as opposed to when you're working in your business and both have to be paid for. Um, so again, just don't be afraid to, to value yourself and value yourself properly. Donal, can I take you up a little bit on, on revenue? I mean, I would always stress to people from the very uh, start that they mm -hmm. register with revenue. And can you, you were talking a little bit about revenue being approachable, which anytime I've been in touch with them, um, to find out more information, say for a client or myself or whatever, I have found them ex extremely approachable. And yeah. I would always say to people, just get registered as soon as you start. Is, wouldn't that be the correct approach? Oh, well, it would. I mean, that, that, that's actually your legal obligation. So if I, if I gave any um, uh, indication, otherwise, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, that is your legal obligation to, to register from when you start. Um, uh, now, look at I mean, you know, a couple of weeks or a couple of months isn't going to isn't going to kill anybody, and you can backdate it. So, so I wouldn't be getting too upset. But yes, uh, yes, register early um, and and be as familiar with things as you can. But the, the the biggest problem with revenue, you see, I suppose revenue have grown over the last twenty years. They they have gone from from um, a very paper based system to a to a highly online system now, um, and. If there is a problem with revenue, it goes through a step process. A letter will issue, you know, what's, what's called maybe a seven day letter. If you, if, you owe if you owe revenue, if you bob and you can't pay them, you'll get a letter out. If you don't react to that letter, you'll get a more severe one. If you don't react to that one, you'll get a sheriff knocking on your door. And that's very unpleasant, but it's quite easily resolved by just ringing revenue and, and making a deal with revenue. You know, um, the, the, the revenue people aren't to be feared, but the thing is not to ignore them. So if correspondence comes in from revenue, get on the phone, get in contact with them, or bring it to your accountant, or bring it to your advisor, or, or, or somebody else that can deal with it, but don't ignore it. Because if you ignore it, it'll, a couple of days later, it just becomes much more difficult uh, to resolve. And if it goes to a sheriff, it's very, very unpleasant. 
Um, so we don't want to go there. A kind of that's the worst case scenario. We absolutely don't want that. Yeah, thank you for that, Donald. Just just to um, clarify, when I was saying, you know, encouraging people to register, I, I know it's a legal requirement, but what often people say to me is, Emer, I've been researching for six months. I've done a couple of uh, weekend fairs. That's, you know, small things. But I would say, you know, from the very beginning, if you get registered, because, I mean, there mightn't be anything due. Yes, yes. No? Uh, and, and again, I suppose... Again, what 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 oftentimes you can have is a hobby, and the hobby becomes a business. And I suppose the question then becomes, well, you know, when does it cease to be a hobby and begin to be a business? And and I suppose it's at the point that it begins to be a business is the point you would register. But by the same token, you know, there's an awful lot of people that are going to a market once a week, or they're selling their few bits and bobs occasionally, or at the odd market here and there. They're probably losing their shirt because their travelling cost. Is probably more than eating up the, the, the bit of profit that they be, might be making on the sales. So to register might be to your advantage if you've got other taxes that you're paying through the PAYE system that might be refunds owed to you. And um, so I, I wouldn't ever fear. Uh, I suppose the, the the problem with income tax is it becomes a problem when you have a lot of income, but if you've got a lot of income, it shouldn't be a problem because you have a lot of income. So it's a kind of a catch twenty two one, you know. Um, uh, I, I suppose people fear the tax man and, and sometimes some, without foundation, uh, you know, because when, when your sales are low, you're not going to have a high problem. You know, it, it, it's, it would be unlikely that you would have a major tax liability. But revenue do have quite severe penalties if they do come across you operating a business that is not registered. So it, 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 they, have, they have quite extensive powers and, and they can use, they have a big, big, big stick if they want to beat us up with it. Um, so yes, it, it is important to register, I would say, yes. Bernie, would you like to take it up from here? Bernie, you're... Apologies. Um, yeah, no, even the revenue side of things and your, your, your tax, um, paying your taxes and keeping on top of that's really important. Um, I would also talk to support agencies initially around supports and how you might qualify for supports for a, a, a young business as well. Um, and I would do that before I, well, early enough so that you don't miss out on any supports that are open to you um, by maybe jumping ahead too quickly into something. So just be very informed about supports that are out there that local, local Leos can offer you, um, and other support agencies and what their, uh, what their um, criteria are in terms of you qualifying for those because by, sometimes by accident you could actually knock yourself out of the criteria if you like. So just be very, very aware of it. There's an awful lot of support out there. There's a huge amount from the local enterprise offices from you know, different government agencies. So speak to them, research it know where you sit and with it before you start uh, formalizing your businesses as such. Because there are things, well, social welfare can support you. You know, there are other areas that can support you, but just be very aware of how, how it fits together and what okay. will maximize the benefit for you. I have a nice one here. Uh, well, Donald might consider it a nice one. Yeah, um, can you uh, map out for us the major considerations for a new business as to whether one should uh, register for VAT or not. I've got a question here. Do you register for VAT for a new business? It's a few months old. Can you walk us through make the VAT or non-VAT registration decision? Okay. Well, well, if we if we start with with the legal obligations, um, now if you are selling products, uh, a physical product, then. The, the threshold, in other words, the, the point at which you're legally obliged to register for VAT is 75,000 euros per year. So if your sales level reaches that, you have no choice in the matter. You must register for VAT. If it's a service that you're providing, so uh, I mean, if you're, if you're a, a painter or a plumber or a candlestick maker, I suppose, um, the, the service that you provide, the limit, no, you have me now, uh, 30, I think it's 37,500 is the, is the threshold. Again, over which it's an obligation of yours to register for VAT, so you have no choice. Now, oftentimes, I suppose, 
the, the choice is where, where your sales have not yet reached those totals, you have choice because you can what they call elect to be registered for VAT, even though you legally don't need to. And some of the reasons why you might choose to register for VAT are, um, okay, in the first instance, if you're going into business on day one and you have to buy a lot of equipment or you've to spend heavily on machinery or equipment or, or fitting out a shop or you know whatever it might be, there can be a significant amount of VAT on the capital items that you're buying. So if you're not VAT registered, you cannot recover the VAT on that expenditure. So uh, it, it may be worth your while to register for that very reason. But the problem with registering for VAT is you cannot willy nilly, you cannot register today and deregister tomorrow and then register two days later and deregister. And you can't have one single aspect of your business being VAT registered and another aspect of your business not being VAT registered. You're either all in, you're either VAT registered or you're not. So the, the, the main disadvantage to, to being VAT registered, I guess, is it, it makes to the, to the non-registered person. So if you're selling on the high street and you're selling to a normal consumer and that consumer is not VAT registered, they don't realize that there's VAT embedded in the price that you charge to them. So if you charge them 100 euros, there is 23% VAT embedded in that 23 euros, or sorry, in that 100 euros, but they don't see it. They, they, don't, they just see they're spending 100 euros. Whereas if you're selling to somebody that is in turn VAT registered, they will see the price as being 81 euros plus VAT and they will recover the, the difference. So they don't see the VAT at all. Uh, so I guess it comes down to who are your customers in the first instance. Uh, if you're not at the VAT thresholds, then you have some degree of choice. Uh, and the, the, the next thing is then, is it going to impact on your customers and on your own margins uh, and again, that, that takes a little bit of detail. Uh, I suppose uh, I could go back and say, if you look at the, the presentation of, was it two weeks ago? Yes. Yeah. We had a slide or two on it. Um, so um, um, mm -hmm. that can be a little more difficult to work out. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that, Donald, thank you for that, that if someone would like to look at the presentation from two weeks ago that was on the new retail landscape and uh, uh, pricing one's product, there's a fair bit on the implications and the various approaches in there. Now, I have a couple of questions here. Um, if somebody's really bad at bookkeeping, would it be advisable to uh, look at employing a, a bookkeeper, Donal, and uh, how much should we pay them? Uh, well, as every accountant out there will tell you, bookkeepers do 95% of the work and get 5% of the applause, I suppose, you know, whereas accountants are the world's worst. We, we get all the applause, but we do very little of the work. So a, book, a good bookkeeper is worth their weight in gold. Um, now, um, bookkeeping can be, as I suppose, as, <laughs> as difficult or as easy as, as you make it. Um, sometimes a mistake is made, oh, I'm no good at bookkeeping, I'm not even gonna try, and we don't do anything. You know, simple bookkeeping is very simple. It's, it's, it's a list of your payments and a list of your receipts. And, you know, you see your purchase invoices and sales invoices, and there's not much else to it. Um, but must you employ a bookkeeper? Uh, again, depending on the complexity of your business, th there are lots of bookkeepers out there. You probably don't need to employ one full time. I mean, you'd be able to employ a part time one or maybe employing a bookkeeper on a, on a, you know, as a, as a, as a contractor into your business um, or ask your accountant to provide the service. Um, there, there's lots of ways out, but you know, I, I suppose once upon a time, I would have encouraged clients of mine very heavily to do their own bookkeeping. And, and I learned out one day, I think we were getting a bit of painting done at home and a painter said to me, well, why don't you just paint this bit and I'll finish it off. You know, so bookkeeping is for some and it's not for others. But if you can do it, it, it can be, um, again, it's like doing a business plan. It can force you into good discipline. You know, good discipline, having good control over your checkbook, having good control over the bank account, good control over your order books. Um, it, it can force a discipline on you. Whereas when you outsource it, you know, sometimes sometimes you're, you're kind of saying, oh, that, that little problem, we'll push that to the side and we won't worry about it because Mary or Anne or Tommy or Jack or whoever it is is looking after it for me. Whereas if you're forced to get into your own bookkeeping, um, it does force you to, to, to look at your own business. But, but 
you know, you, you can't do everything too. I mean, none of us, none of us can. Uh, so I don't know, that's a roundabout way of saying there's no right answer, but there's no wrong answer. Okay, that, that's somebody that's once you... told me, so, sorry for cutting this, somebody once told me to do an hour of bookkeeping every morning before you do anything else. Make that a discipline. Now, if I had to listen to them, it would be great, but it would seem like really, really good advice to discipline yourself to an hour of bookkeeping every morning and then go ahead and do your creative stuff. Yeah. Well, and I, and I would just even add to that, that the, the only thing about avoiding doing the bookkeeping is that it really does give you an insight in the state of your business. Um, and it really keeps you in touch with, you know, what products are working for you financially and what aren't. Um, I'd be resident to just, you know, to give all of that over to somebody without some sort of you know, feedback from them and, and, and keep really on top of, you know, what's working within the business itself. So I'd agree as well that you can't do everything. Absolutely, you can't do everything. And you should certainly offload elements that you can offload because running a business on your own, it's huge. There's so many different elements. And if you're not good at something, by all means, find somebody who is good at it. Um, and you get on with the good stuff that you're really good at, but keep an eye on that element. You can go for years without knowing that something is losing your money. So just keep your eyes peeled and keep on top of it really. Is there a good app or bookkeeping program that people could use? Uh, there, 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 there are lots actually. Um, there's, there's, again, depending on, on your business and, and depending on the complexity of it, um, but there are an awful lot of, of quite inexpensive, good bookkeeping packages. Um, I'll mention three. There's Big Red Book, uh, there's Surf, Surf Accounts, and then there's Z uh, Xerox. Z-X-E-R-O-L. Yeah, Xerox. Um, they're all online systems. They would cost maybe 20 euros a month, including VAT. That kind of range, you know, 200 quid a year plus VAT. Um, they're, they're, they're superb. And again, depending on how complicated your business is, um, they, they may be inadequate for the biggest of the big businesses, but for most of us, they, they'd be more than adequate. And, and they're very good at controlling the basic sales and purchase of functions and, and, and um, um, again, relatively inexpensive. The, the, the phone apps that have, have been kind of come to, to prominence in recent years, is, I mean, the one that will come to mind is the invoice to go, uh, which is superb, uh, but it, it, it would be more on your sales side um, it's kind of probably designed for the tradesman that's out meeting 10 or 12 customers a day doing bits and bobs at each house and going on. And um, they're very good to generate an invoice, to email the invoice and kind of collect the money and, and do that sort of thing. Um, what else is there come to mind? Um, Xero, e -X -E -X -E -R -O -X. X -E -R -O -X. Xerox.com. It's a, it's a, it's a US based, uh, but they have quite a presence in Ireland. The Big Red Book are somewhere in Dublin. Uh, Surf accounts are somewhere in, they're in Tala, I think it is. Uh, Big Red Book are, I forget where, Ternure or somewhere. Um, uh, there was Tesora Software had a, uh, they, they're, they're very prominent in the payroll accounting software. Um, they have an accounting package as well. Look, there's, there's, there's loads of them. If you, again, if you do a bad word, but if you Google it, there's, you know, 10 or 12 of them will come up. And, and they're, they're all quite good. They're very modern. They're quite easy to use. Um, you know, uh, I mean, they're quite easy to use, I suppose. Yeah, they are quite easy to use. You know, I mean, one transaction, once, once you master one transaction type, it, it, it's just repetitive after that. Um, okay. so, There's someone here saying that auto entry captures receipts and it's great too. Um, sorry, what's that? Auto entry, that it captures receipts, it's great too. That was okay, yes. Earlier, yeah. Yes. Uh, and there's a, there's a newer piece of software now on the, a thing called Receipt Bank, which is kind of an, an app on your phone where you photograph your receipts and invoices and it kind of wiggles up into the cloud and it kind of converts them into accounting speak and you can download them then into your accounting software or bookkeeping software. And it kind of takes a lot of the, again, if you, if you have staff that are on the road or if you yourself are on the road and you've, you end up with a lot of itty bitty you know, five euro for a cup of coffee here and three euro, where are you drinking your coffee? Says you with your five euro coffee. But if you're two euros here and five euros there and a sandwich here and, a, you know, then you can end up with receipts coming out your back pocket and too many of them. Whereas this little thing is lovely and neat that you just snap it and you can throw away the physical receipt because you've got an electronic copy of it and uh, it 
just stores it up in the cloud and it's it's um it's 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 great for the likes of accountants because the accountants hate seeing someone coming with a shoebox full of twenty thousand little bits of paper. Rachel, Rachel, thank you so much for giving us those um, insights on the platforms. I have one here on COVID. Um, someone has come off a COVID payment to reopen their gallery, but there are no tourists around. If no tourists return to the area, uh, can you go? Can you go back to? reconnecting with those payments i my understanding is that you can reconnect but you can't go retrospective donald do you have any update? I, I would agree i would agree or i I'd, I'd need to check it now but i i i i do that that would seem to me i mean look the one thing i have to admire with the government in recent months was that they they didn't hang about and they kind of made it relatively easy for people to to get these supports um, and and government policy hasn't changed they, they're they're there to make sure people aren't stuck on a friday so I, I would assume, I, I, I think yes. Okay, okay, thank you but for I, that. But I, I can't swear to that, Eamor, I, I, I can't swear to it. Okay, well, we, we, we will check that. Um, Bern, just before I ask Bernie to um, tie up and, and, and thank everyone for the day, I just want to give a big shout out to um, our Made Local uh, campaign, which hopefully will help everyone. Um, and anybody who's interested in the Future Makers Award, particularly the Enterprise one, uh, that there's there's still time to get your applications in for that, and they'll be on the website. So, Bernie, can I hand over to you now, please? Yeah, that'd be great. Donald, you wouldn't mind um, stop sharing your slide. Oh gosh, the... sorry, I. Super. Uh, I know, so I can escape. Now, what am I doing? Let me see. We're still seeing. Oh, I'm <laughs> stop sharing. Stop. stop, stop, stop. ABC is a What was that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so bear with me now and I'll hop into mine. Okay. Lost it, I? Sorry, beg your pardon. I've lost it somewhere. Here we go. So I basically wanted to wind up on um, something called the Lean Canvas and I think it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a, a visualization of your business plan on one page and it's not a business plan. So I know Donald will kill me for even saying that. It's, it's literally, <clears throat> it's a page where you can put everything down in one page and it's very, very visual. And I think it really suits anybody that's in the sector that we're in. And it means that you can fill in all the different areas. There's loads of um, online um, uh, sites that you can, you can get this from but it will allow you to pop and populate one page with all the different elements of your business. And it just means you can change things and review it quite easily by going into each of those areas. And you can see right in the middle of it is that unique value proposition that I spoke to, spoke to you about earlier. And without that clear uh, unique value proposition defined, it's very, very difficult to populate the rest of this uh, this um, uh, uh, canvas. So again, I'm just referring back to that, that that's a really, really important thing to do. <clears throat> um, so have a look at one of those as a possibility for you to help you review your business, where it is, where it might like to go, and how you might like to build it. I think it's a very useful tool. And then the other thing in terms of conclusion, I just want to kind of go over a couple of tiny little things that we spoke about. The main one is know your value. And but what I mean by that is the value of your business in terms of the, um, your value as, in terms of its worth, but also the value that your business brings to the consumer and know what that value is and know what that value proposition is. So it's the value of your self-worth as well as your business. Make sure that your personal aesthetic for the business, that your aesthetic is something that's stands out that's very different and that you you can recognize it and you can figure out that it's a certain specific type of aesthetic that's working for you 
Review that and make sure that you don't lose it or you don't dilute it or you don't vary away from it in some way. Communicate it clearly, communicate everything clearly. So don't wishy-washy things, don't add in things to your business model that's going to detract from what you're actually trying to do and what your goal is with it. Be consistent with absolutely everything. So that's your packaging, your photography, your product, your finish, your quality, everything. And in terms of, of um, photography, which I didn't mention earlier, and I did want to mention this to you, because most of the business is moving, you, a lot of you will be moving online, we can't see, touch or feel anything. So spend a bit of time on visual photography and trying to document, document your product to allow people to experience it in a way that they can't experience it in the store, but you just need to figure out some way that you're communicating that really clearly to them. So if it's, if it's a, a, a cashmere piece, you know, how soft is that? How luxurious is it? How beautiful is it? So be, communicate it, be consistent in that communication so that if it's, if it's a certain brand, identity or a brand ethos, be consistent with that communication. Review the business regularly. Um, you're only a few years in if you're at that early stage, but it's worth reviewing it continuously as you go along and sort of really look at what's working and what's working, not working and act on those findings. Don't go, oh sure, it's not working. What am I going to do? Ignore it, act on it. So if there's something that's working, push the opportunity. If there's something that's not working so well, figure out, do I need it or do I get, do I change what I'm doing? Do I pivot? Um, and again, seek help. And we've all said that all three speakers, we've said, seek help when you need it. You know, don't be afraid to ask There's organizations out there, the support's available. And in fact, I know Ema referred to some of the other webinars. Um, if you go through them and go back over them, there's huge information available and they're pre-recorded. They're on the site. Go back, look at them. Um, it, it'll give you other information that you might be seeking or missing at the moment. And the biggest thing is you know your business far better than most other people. You're in the middle of it. You know, trust your own judgment there. Um, trust that you're going to make the decisions that you need to make. Value it and believe in what you're doing. And once you have that belief that what you're doing is, is really positive and, and you're, you're enthusiastic about it and you, you love what you do, which most of us do because otherwise we wouldn't be doing it, trust that and go with your gut instinct and drive the business forward. And I hope that you'll have every success and that we'll, you'll figure some way out of this COVID by pivoting or you know, looking at your business in another light or adding to the business or changing maybe how you find a route to your, your customers. And uh, thank you for listening to us all. Thank you, Adrienne and Domo. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we've been given lots of information today. And dear Jolene, thank you uh, so much for sharing that uh, website, which we will pass on to everybody. Um, and as Bernie said, you know, go back, go back over what we've covered already. Uh, next week, we will be looking at five years and beyond in business. And we have Aideen Bodkin with us. So here's hoping that every benef everyone benefits from the MED local campaign. And uh, if you need any help, please get in touch. So thank you, everyone. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks. Bye, guys.